Cheers and welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. Yes, it's getting cold in Florida. <laughs> So it's about as, as heavy as we go, unless it really gets crazy, you know, somewhere below 70. But this is efficiencies to the max, how to maximize your grains for the best utilization. Okay, I know some people are like, rrr, rrr. you know, I used to drive a lot of economy cars and I love to get the best gas mileage out of my cars. Now I drive a Mini Cooper now and I just go crazy, but hey, before, yeah. And you're just talking little tiny cars that had tiny engines and I didn't make very much money and I needed to maximize every dollar. So, you know, 49 miles to a gallon, things like that. And yeah, that was back in the days before electric cars. So this is all about maximizing your grains, getting the most bang for your buck. And who should watch this? Or please do me a favor. If you feel like you're really good at this and you know, you watch this video and maybe you do, maybe you don't learn something new. Every time you see someone in a forum go, hey, my efficiencies suck, or hey, my efficiencies are low, or what do I do to fix my efficiencies? Just post the link to this video. That, that's all I'm asking. Just post a link to this video. It'll be huge to the channel. I'll appreciate it. Everybody will appreciate it because we'll get more likes, we'll get more subscribe subscriptions, and that means I'll get more vendors working with me so we can do even more. Yes, yes, and I got some giveaways coming up around the holidays, so definitely keep watching. But what are we discussing? Discussing, yeah, discussing. I can't even say the word. Mash and brew house efficiencies and how to maximize them. Yes, mash efficiencies and brew house efficiencies. I'm going to give you over 22 ways. Yeah, I know you're going, what? Over 22 ways to increase your efficiencies. What are we going to discuss? Temperature, grain, crush, pH, mash, thickness, time, water, system, and software. And yeah, mash too. But hey, who should worry about efficiencies? Well, first of all, if you're new to brewing, let it go. Just let it go, please. If you're about mm, three to five, unless you're OCD and you're two to three in, on a new system, yeah, let it go. Uh, I have three anvils and I bought the first two and my efficiencies have always been very high for the majority of my brews, unless I'm really maxing out the grains. And Anvil was kind enough to send me another one and I went in to do, a, and my efficiencies were low. And I'm like, they did change some things. So I had to relearn my processes. Plus I was getting lazy with some of my processes. So it didn't help there either. I was actually on a, a little like a group chat, conference call, questionnaire, whatever you want to call, with Denny Khan a little while back, if you know who Denny Khan is. And he's like, stop stressing out about everything. Just enjoy brewing. And he'd had a new book come out recently, and that, that was his point. Just enjoy the process, enjoy brewing. And that's really, you know, where most people go. But for me, I like learning, I like tweaking, and it's the way it is. So before we jump into the 22, I'm gonna cover a couple of things to make sure you understand this. First, I'm big on Beersmith, that's what I use. I am trying to use Brewfather, but I'm big on Beersmith because I know it, I have my inventory, everything's good, it works for me but this is kind of how it works. So for example, let's say you have 10 pounds of malt, okay? Take 10 pounds, the potential is 1.037 in a five gallon recipe. So you take 37 times 10 divided by five, that gives you 74. So in a perfect world, in a perfect world, you would be 1.074 after mashing in on a five gallon batch. It's not a perfect world. <laughs> I hate to break that to you, but if you are getting 100% efficiency in anything, your calculations are off. I'm not gonna say they're necessarily wrong. They are, but they're off. You're missing something. Uh, you forgot something, you added something. Something is off and it may not necessarily be your fault and we'll kind of go over some of those things so you understand that, okay? <sighs> mash efficiencies. <clears throat> this is how much of your potential sugar content makes it to the boil kettle, or you know, you're pulling your mash out is in the same kettle, and your brew house efficiencies, kind of that whole thing, minus losses for things like dead space, um, your transfer, trub losses, some pop matter, things like that. That's gonna keep some liquid held behind. And there are ways to account for that 
and make sure that you're either up, down, or somewhere around that number. Okay, number one. Yes, we're going to jump right into this. Like I said, we have over 22. Number one, pre-brew calculations. Number one is pre-brew calculations. And if you watch Barbecue Larry, you'll know, you've probably seen this, especially if he's doing a live stream. He has a spreadsheet. He doesn't even use software. I prefer software, but he has a spreadsheet. And I've watched him go, that's not right. Something's wrong here. And double check his calculations, double check his numbers. And sometimes it is right. Sometimes, you know, it's one way or another and he just didn't expect it, but he's always double checking his calculations. And that's why I'm saying pre-brew, that's kind of mid-brew, but pre-brew. Using software for this helps a lot. Using spreadsheets that help to already calculate things helps a lot. Is auto calculating. I use Beersmith, which really measures the estimated mash efficiencies, and I don't focus on that as much. It really focuses more on the brew house efficiencies, which I find is more convenient because it's at the end of the brew day. I can start double checking all my numbers, verify everything. You know, occasionally, yes, I do take measurements of my gravity just before the boil. And I'll mention something that somebody sent me a long time back. Yeah, Brewing America. They have some cool hydrometers, okay? And I know everybody's familiar with the little triple hydrometer with even the temperature probe in it. But this hydrometer right here, if you're one of those people who wants to measure your gravity before you go start boiling, this is a hydrometer calibrated for 155 Fahrenheit. This one's calibrated for 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 155. 155 is probably around what your mash temp is, plus or minus a little. But yeah, it's pre-calculated for that. And you know, you can use an easy dens. I, I love the easy dens, but the problem is you've got to get the temperature down because although it will auto-calculate for temp, don't be dropping 155 degree mash ward in there. That's, that's not a good thing. You don't want to do that. Number two, grain selection. I know this might sound a little odd, but trust me on this one. Let's say you're adding Pilsner, okay? And you go into your little program and you're like, Pilsner, and it's like, hey, what brand? And you're like, ah, Breeze, that's, that, 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 I don't care. You should. <laughs> First of all, it's a plant. So even if the malter says it will give you 1.037 based on this much, and max, of course, yeah, it could vary a little. Especially that bag that you got, it could vary a little. Now, you've got Avangard or you've got Wireman's or something else and you called it Brees and this one over here says it'll do 1.034 and you're thinking in your calculations, it's telling you 1.037. Well, right there, your efficiencies are gonna be low or the other way around. They're gonna be higher even though you, you don't know why they're so high. So that's something to be aware of. I um, can't remember if it was Brewlosophy or who it was had mentioned one time, I think, it was, yeah, it was Brutalosophy, had mentioned that their efficiencies were really low for a while, and he started talking to some friends who had all bought the same base malts around the same time. They figured out it was the base malts were really, really low compared to what they should have been, and they bought some more, and they didn't have any more problems. So, yeah, grain selection. Try to get your brand, your exact grain selection. It might vary a little, but the closer your numbers, the better your numbers coming out. Bad information in, bad information out. You wanna to try to get those numbers as accurate as possible. I'm not gonna go into a video about it, but go check out the term diastatic power. Look it up, you'll be like, wow, yeah. Number three, verify your recipe matches your ingredients. And I know you're sitting there going, you know what you just kinda of said? <laughs> yeah, no. Now, this one, and this might be why I had a delay in doing this video, because I just read about this recently, and I've seen it before, but I had forgotten about it. When you get your grains, and this is where this one came from, this gentleman got his grains pre-crushed all together in a bag from his local homebrew shop. He came home, and something in his mind said, you know what, double check the weight of that. He checked three different scales. He was almost a pound shy of what he had actually ordered and requested from his local homebrew shop. And of course, that day that he needed it, he doesn't know what he's shy on and his local homebrew shop is closed. One of the reasons I always get everything in a separate bag so I know exactly what I have and I can change my recipe a little and tweak it too because I know exactly what's in each bag. But yeah, double check. So you're brewing, you go check it, you're like, okay. Now, if you waited out just before you did like I do, you're fine. But if you ordered it, you got it, 
even if it's all together and it says it's 16 pounds of grain and you put it on there and it comes up 14, you got a problem. So verify your recipe matches the ingredients you have or your ingredients, however you want to say. That includes things like late boil additions, corn sugars are common items to forget. I do that occasionally. I'll have everything ready. Well, I didn't crush corn sugar. I got in a container sitting over there and I just know I need it. I do everything and I get to the end and go, did I forget something? No, I'm good. And then later I'm like, why is the gravity so low? Oh, crap. Yeah, I almost did it recently on a stout. I almost forgot to lactose. <laughs> I added it literally at the last five minutes. I think maybe the last two minutes, but hey, it's okay. Number four, and everybody should know this one if you're into brew house efficiencies and mash efficiencies, grain crush. Grain crush, grain crush, grain crush. This is why it's awesome to buy your own grain mill. And I will put links down below for any and everything I mentioned. Yes, if you click on it, some of them are affiliate links. They kick me a couple, a couple nickels, dimes, and I do mean nickels and dimes. I think Amazon, I'm sitting at about $200 for the whole year. And you all go crazy shopping on Amazon. Trust me on that one. I appreciate everybody who clicks on my links. So grain crush. Now I'm going to use an anvil foundry as an example. Okay. It's because I'm very familiar with it. I've used a grain father. I would also suggest it on there, but my grain crush personally, is 0 0.0375. Recently, because I got a new grain mill, it's 0 0.035. It's a preset. It just <laughs> makes sense to me. But when I do rye, I do a 0 0.025. Why? Because rye won't get crushed well going through a 0 0.035 or 375. So because it's a smaller malt, I have to adjust. If I'm using my Brew easy, I go to a 0 0.025 for the entire grain bill because it's a finer mesh. It just, it works. And that is one of the keys with having your own grain mill. You can crush everything to what you want because even, and, and I do say this, in my opinion, you want the smallest crush possible that doesn't cause a stuck mash on your system. And you don't want to go too far because if you do, you're going to actually go the other direction and your efficiencies are going to be awful because you're going to get a stuck mash. Yeah. And oh, and if you haven't noticed, I'm wearing an Into the AM t-shirt. I love these damn shirts. They're just very comfortable. They look super cool. I get lots of compliments and I got a 10% coupon or code down below. You click there, go check it out. Over time, we'll get more shirts and hopefully down the road, we'll be doing some giveaways on those too. So let's go into number five. And number five, it is hilarious. I mention this occasionally and people go, what, really? Yeah, <laughs> speed of your crush. Yes, speed, low, yeah, low and slow, slow it down, slow it down. Okay, I use a Ryobi drill, which is probably sitting here somewhere within reach, but I use a Ryobi drill and I actually had a problem with my rye recently because even though I said it at that, I forgot I had it on high speed and it was like, Zzz! Yeah, I would say maybe 60 to 75% of my grain got crushed properly. The rest did not. Yeah, if you're going really fast, it's going to shoot through that grain mill and it's not going to get crushed properly. Now, if you have a manufacturer's system with a motor in it, that motor is usually optimized for the speed so that it crushes things properly. Okay, for you, if you're using your own grain mill and you're using a drill or some other power device, nice and slow torque. I mean, the torque's great, but the speed you don't need just... Nice and slow, get a good crush, and rock on. Number six, pH. Yes, does pH matter? I did a video on this a while back. I've done some other tests, even though I didn't do videos on those. Trust me, pH matters. Yeah, you can use software to kind of help predict where your pH is going to be, but taking a pH reading with a pre-calibrated pH meter, preferably with auto temperature adjustment, for then reason, of course, like I got the doctor pH meter. I love this thing. I do need to get another pH meter here very, very soon because I'm afraid I'm going to break this thing. I've been really starting to use it more religiously again. I kind of slacked a little, but if you're between 5.2 and 5.6, you're going to get a really good gravity. If you're way outside of that bounds, yeah, especially if you're on the high side, it's going to impact your gravity. I've already kind of proven that. I proved it to myself and was very shocked the first time I did it, which I did on video. Yeah, and I had a lot of really really good technical people who understood it better chime in in the comments, and I was very, very appreciative to that because I learned just like you learn through doing it and time and experience, 
and we all learn from each other. Number seven, brewing salts. And you're thinking, brewing salts are gonna influence it? Well, brewing salts do influence the flavor and the mouthfeel, but you know what? <gasps> they impact your pH. Yes, we just mentioned that, yeah. Brewing salts, and brewing salts are so simple, I promise you. If you need help, get yourself beer smith, I will walk you through it, okay? Super, super, super simple, as long as you can get distilled water, RO water, or like I have RO with deionized, which I prefer, but some people's RO water is extremely low in dissolved solids too, which is fine. Number eight, and we're gonna go back to barbecue Larry on this, but number eight, water to grain ratio. Water to grain ratio. Okay, it's called mash thickness. And I could do a standalone video, I probably could do several videos on this, but Barbecue Larry did a really great one probably about a year ago. And he was trying to explain the differences in the mash thickness and the benefits and things like that. And I don't know if he went in so much on the gravity itself, I don't remember, it's been a little while. But yeah, he did a really great video on it. Now, if your mash is very thick, it's going to hinder the enzyme activity, it's gonna hinder your ability to pull those sugars out, which is going to impact your original gravity. Now, shockingly, if it's super, super, super thin, I never realized this, it's based on pH and temperature, and that, like I said, we could write a book about this. Um, it can cause stability problems with the enzymes, which could impact your original gravity. Plus, if you go super thin, you're gonna be boiling it off for a long time, maybe wanna have some late, late hop additions. So that's just something to be aware of. Follow the recommendations of the manufacturer for your equipment, for your grain to water, water to grain ratio. If it's a do it yourself, try to estimate, figure it out, test it a few times, figure out what works for you. Number nine, mash temperatures. Yeah, okay. I had to throw this in because it was relevant, but within reason, of course, temperature wise, mash temperatures should not impact your original gravity, which means it should not impact your mash efficiencies or your brew house efficiencies, but it will impact your FG or your final gravity. So keep in mind, higher mash temps, you're going to have less fermentable sugars, more mouthfeel usually. And if you have lower mash temps, a little less mouthfeel and more fermentable sugars usually. Usually, and I always say usually because there's always exceptions, but I had to put mash temps in here because this is something to be aware of and just know. Number 10, mashing in. Yes. <laughs> I know in my videos, I'm like, Zzz! I'm speeding it up like 1,000 to 2,000 times what I'm actually doing. Yes, my duration increase is literally between 1,000 and 2,000 based on how long I took to mash in. So when you see me going screaming fast, that really is screaming fast. So mashing in, low and slow wins every time. Stir consistently and constantly while adding your grains to ensure that you have no dough balls. And the one thing, it's, it's a personal pet peeve and I apologize to new brewers. I'm not busting on you in any way. We all have to start and we all have to learn and I high five, kudos that you're actually getting in there and learning how to brew. Every life skill is an amazing life skill and home brewing to me is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, yeah, it's my favorite. But hey, I hear this term, I didn't see any dough balls. I didn't see any dough balls. Sorry, I had to step away and get this. Okay, <laughs> if you've ever been walking in the ocean and you feel something bump into your leg and you're like, ooh, a fish or something touched me. Yeah, the best way to find dough balls is when you're stirring and you hit something that's not letting that spoon just go smooth. It kind of feels like you, you bumped something a little more solid than a little bit of grain. That is the best way to find dough balls. And then what you do is you pull it up to the top. You'll see it, break it up. It might just be a clump, just break it up. Number 11, give your grain bed time to rest. Yes, allow it to settle, allow it to rest. Everybody seems to agree on 10 minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes, so let's go with 10 minutes. Allow your grain bed to rest. And I'm guilty, sometimes I'm like seven, eight minutes, but if you're doing recirculation, by the time you get it all set up, it's probably pretty close to 10, especially if you take your time doing it. So give your grain bed time to rest. Number 12, <clears throat> yeah, and no, it's not cat litter, but if you've seen my videos, I just ran out this weekend, I buy rice hulls and I fill this thing. I use a lot of rice hulls and there's a lot of benefits to rice hulls. So yes, number 12 is rice hulls. Rice hulls are cheap, 
insurance when brewing with certain grains like rye, wheat, oatmeal, overcrushed grains. Um, yeah, y you can get a minor stuck mash and never realize it. Rice hulls, rice hulls, rice hulls. Number 13, rice hulls again. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you rice hulls again, but for a different reason. Okay, number 13 is rice hulls again. Yes, they're cheap insurance, even if you aren't using grains that are known to cause stuck mashes, what they will do is they will help reduce channeling in your mash. So if you get a stuck mash from time to time, or you just don't feel like your efficiencies are where they should be, toss a, a silo cup or two worth of rice hulls into your grain, mix it up, okay? It's going to allow the water slash wort as it pulls the sugars to flow more evenly throughout the entire grain bed and not through a bunch of channels that are created because everything's all sticky and gooey. Yeah, rice hulls, rice hulls, rice hulls. I'm telling you, super cheap insurance like you wouldn't believe, but it will help your grain bed. Number 14, grain bed. Yes, you want the perfect grain bed. I did a video about this, the perfect grain bed, but grain bed, okay? This takes the last four items into consideration and puts them all together. Don't layer your grain bed, it just don't, don't. Just mix it all together. Some grains will help better than others and you want them all to work together. The only exception to this is rice hulls. I'm lazy sometimes, I'll toss them on top. Why? Because they float. So as my grains are going in and I'm stirring, they're sticking to some of the grains and it's being pulled down into the actual grain bed. So yeah, rice hulls are the only exception. Everything else just kind of mixes together. Don't layer a bunch of oatmeal on top. I hear people, well, don't put the oatmeal on the bottom, put it on the top. Okay, so your stuck mash is at the top. <laughs> Stir it up. Yeah, the hulls from all of those other grains are helping and mixing them all up together is helping. So yeah, mix it up. Number 15, mash time. More time, more activity, with diminishing returns over time. So I haven't done, personally, an overnight mash, but I've heard, oh my gosh, yeah, I had great utilization, great efficiencies. So doing an overnight mash, with the exception of if you're doing a sour, it's different of, yeah, whatever. But basically, you're gonna get better efficiencies than someone doing a 30 minute mash, okay? Personally, I prefer to stick to 90 minutes. I have done a few 120 minutes, usually because I gotta run and get food or do something else during the mash, but I have done a few 120 minutes, and those 120 minutes have had really good mash efficiencies slash brew house efficiencies and the end of the brew. So keep in mind the amount of time it takes and what's available, you know, it's, it's a balancing game. What works for you? If you love low efficiencies and you just wanna be quick and you're that type of person, you know, in and out, 30 minutes, fine. What works for you? Me, personally, 90 minutes. I don't even mind doing 90 minute boils even though 60 minutes is where everybody seems to be going and eventually I'll get there, but hey, Sometimes I'm just learning the process. Number 16, check your mash. Guilty, check your mash throughout the brew when you're mashing. Check it periodically, okay? Hint, when the water is sitting up on top and it seems a little higher than normal, that's called a stuck mash. Yeah, yeah, when your water's supposed to be about here and it's up here, it's a stuck mash. <laughs> so check your mash periodically throughout the mash to make sure that it's flowing and it's not just kind of rising or sitting. It needs to be, you know, it should be like this, even, even if it's almost constant. It should be nice and it should be flowing on a recirculation, assuming you're doing a recirculation here, okay? 17, mashing in on and all in one. Don't know why that's a tongue twister, but hey, yeah. I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna use the Anvil Foundry as an example, okay? And this goes 100% to pretty much all systems, especially the Bruzilla Gen 4, I know, and the new G30 Grainfather, okay? Yeah. They have these nice little holes here. These holes are great if you're new to brewing, you're still learning the process, you're keeping it simple. But the problem is, is some of the water or wort will flow out of these sides and not go straight through the bottom, which, well, wait, that means the water's not going through all of the grain. Yeah, you're following me, I appreciate that. Right here. It's a small batch adapter, okay? Now, I don't know if all systems have something like this or if this will fit in all systems, I haven't tried. But this on the Anvil Foundry will block those little holes. And it will even work in the new one. 
And what happens is when you block those holes, you force the flow all the way through the grain bed. And when I did my test, I got a full point of efficiency better, which means it's going to impact your efficiencies and make sure that you're getting all of that grain that you paid for utilized within your wart. Number eight, this is also for the mashing in on an all-in-one. I've got a few all-in-ones, a few brew in a bag ones, specifically for those types of brewers. And by all-in-one, I'm talking like the old coffee type system percolating, yeah. It's called the lift and yeah, the lift. So if you haven't seen this, this has definitely been in the Anvil Foundry's uh, group in Facebook, but I've also seen a few people talking about it over in like Brewzilla quite a while back, but hey, it's a very, very simple concept, okay? When you're brewing, you're gonna have some dead space here on every single system. And that doesn't recirculate. Now I have seen some of the very expensive systems out there, you're talking over two grand, that actually, actually do a percolate. The liquid comes up, goes around, comes up, goes around. That's not an issue because it's coming this way, so it's not gonna be dead space. But for the rest of us, we have dead space here. And that water is sitting there and it's not recirculating, okay? That's the key. And if you don't understand this, take a cup of hot water, take some sugar, stir until it dissolves, add more, dissolves, until it won't dissolve. Then add a little bit more hot water. Oh, hey, wait, it's starting to dissolve again. You grasp the concepts. Okay, so needless to say, you have that water there. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to lift this nice and slow at 15 and 30. That's, you don't need to do it more than that. I've figured that out by now. 15 minutes is good, 30 minutes is a little extra, but 15 is really the big bang for the buck. And you have to lift it slowly because if you pull it, you're gonna get a stuck mash. And then when you put it back in, you lower it slowly. I will say this is at your own risk. The new anvil, which I have one sitting around here somewhere, this bottom plate is removable, but it has little locking tips. So it clamps in and I've tested it on that. I don't have any problems. And the small batch adapter fits in there too. So. I don't have any problems with the new anvil. It works just great for that. But yes, doing that lift will release that water and allow it to absorb because water is one of the best solvents in the world. It helps to absorb things that are, it can absorb, but it's going to have to pull those carbs and that sugar and absorb them into the liquid that's circulating through your system. The more water you have, the more it can absorb. So yeah, that one's huge, but that'll probably snag you another point right there. So you got two points just from the last two, if you have an all-in-one. Mashing in on an all-in-one, let it drip, yes. When I take this out, I set it in a pot and I let it drip. That's gonna drip for days, but <laughs> initially it's gonna drip quite a bit. And you're gonna be able to take that off and dump that into the boil, boom. You're, you know, keep in mind, this could impact your boil off if you're not accounting for it. My boil offs are a little bit on the high side. Sometimes I'm usually a little shy or dead on, and I've been doing that for a long time, so I'm good. But yeah, the drip, okay? We'll call it the all-in-one drip. Number 20. Now this is something new, and I just started this, and I've done it three times now with really good success. Actually, four times, three times with good success. <laughs> Just like you can squeeze your brew in a bag, did you know you can squeeze this? It's called a plate. You set the plate right on top of your grains. You grab your, uh, yeah, your wooden brew paddle and you just push down and hold it there and you'll hear it. it'll be like flowing. Again, that could impact your total boil off because you're adding more liquid, but that liquid has lots of sugar in it, okay? And we've already proven it's a myth that you can't squeeze your bag. You can squeeze the bag. It's all good, you're safe. Number 20, B, I guess you could say, brew in a bag. Yeah, you know you can squeeze your bag. Yeah. Actually, there's a YouTube channel out there, I wish I would name him, I just forgot, but he puts two big old grates and just squeezes the bag. So yeah, you can squeeze the bag, it's okay. Number 21, this is for brewing a bag. I started going to the brewing the bag people. Brewing a bag, use the right sized bag for your system and grain capacity. Just because you can get the grains in the bag doesn't mean it's the right size. I've seen this. It's like, it's as tight as it's gonna go all the way to the top. Okay, that grain is so compressed, you might as well have a stuck mash, okay? You need the right size bag for the right amount of grains. Don't go nuts. Yes, adding 
a bag to some systems will get you more grain capacity, but don't to the point that it's being squeezed because it's gonna restrict flow, okay? 22, brewing a bag, doing a sparge. So, and we haven't even touched on sparging, but doing a sparge, it is highly recommend when brewing in a bag to stir at least the top half because it does get squeezed. As you pull it up, it pulls things together and you need to keep that in mind. So stirring up that top half and sparging, you're gonna get a little bit better efficiencies. Number 23, recirculation. We've already commented on that several times, but I haven't mentioned it as an actual item. Recirculation, you're taking any of that dead space that's sitting here or sitting minus the one on the side that we already told you about, okay? And you're flowing it through the grains. You're going to be rinsing those sugars off those grains and you're going to be getting a higher concentration of fermentable sugars in your water, which is gonna be called what? Wart, yeah, wart. So, number 24, sparge. I'm guilty as charged, low and slow. I don't always do low and slow. A lot of systems out there say you don't even have to sparge. It's not a requirement, but keep in mind, when you're pulling sticky, sugary stuff out of that, I guarantee you, everything in there is sticky and sugary. So if you rinse it fast, you're gonna get a little bit more. Now you're gonna have more water to boil off, a little less sugar, but if you go low and slow, you're gonna get more of those sugars that are gonna to go to the boil kettle or be left in the boil kettle based on what kind of system you have. But low and slow. If your green bed looks a little compacted, love this metal spoon. Stir it up, it's fine. Rinse it, stir it up, rinse it. Anything that looks super sticky, rinse it. You're gonna get more sugars, okay? 24, yes, 24. Now we've got a little bit more left, okay? A little bit more. Don't forget, like, subscribe, keep sharing. Yeah, yeah, okay. But now we're gonna move on from mash efficiencies to brew house efficiencies. And how do we do that? We move all of that wort to the boil kettle or we you know, pull everything out and leave it in our boil kettle for an all-in-one or remove the grain basket, brew in a bag, whatever you got. Now we're gonna be going to the next step. Now you can take the measurements for your OG, original gravity, with temperature adjustments taken into account and get the total volume so now you know what your mash efficiencies are. Okay, you're gonna need that, not really. You're gonna need that if you wanna worry about it, <laughs> but I'm worrying about my brew house efficiencies. So Brewing America, like I said, they make that 155 degrees Fahrenheit yeah, so 155, you can check it, no big deal, rock on, don't have to chill that wart. If you moved the exact amount of liquid and you were at the exact expected OG, then you're set. Usually one of those is gonna be off at least a little bit. It's just the way it is. And you can make a choice now, do you need to adjust it in some way or do you just need to rock on in time to boil? Me, let's boil. Okay, <laughs> there isn't anything I can think of during a boil that can help really to impact your brew house efficiencies other than occasionally I'll just dump the whole thing into the fermenter and, and it'll settle out and I'm good and I'll probably get a little bit more liquid out that way but I, I don't usually do that unless I'm just frustrated or exhausted or whatever it may be. Um, but after the boil you simply want to pull off the wort into your fermenter leaving as little behind as possible. So trub, um, hot matter, um, some dead space areas that you just can't get that liquid if your system has that, which this doesn't, it has a little thing that once it creates the suction, it just keeps pulling the liquid until there's no liquid to pull. So I don't really end up with a lot of dead space liquid behind in an anvil. But if your system allows for a lot of dead space where that liquid's just sitting in there, so that's gonna be left behind. Those are going to be taken into account. If you have something like an Easy Dens, oh man, yeah, it's awesome. You can get your gravities very quickly as once it's cooled down, which if you're moving it to your fermenter, I hope it's cooled down. <laughs> but you get that information. And now, once you have this information, this is where you need to decide if you want to make an adjustment. So let's say your gravity is a little low and you can add some corn sugar. You can add some dry malt extract. I prefer corn sugar. It does, for me, it works a little better. It's easier, it dissolves quick, no problem. Or let's say your original gravity is a little high, but your liquid's a little low. You can dilute it. There are calculators. I will leave links down below. If you're in Beersmith, I believe Brewfather has it, you'll find the calculators. There's tons of great calculators out there, but you can adjust dilution calculators. I use the dilution calculator sometimes. Um, actually, a little frequently lately. I've <laughs> my gravity's been high and my liquid's been a little low and I've adjusted and I look really great, but 
yeah, I, I don't want to be crazy here. Or, you know, I'm going for something. I'm not going for whatever the hell happens. So keep in mind, if you have too much liquid, don't reboil. Just don't recommend it. It can impact your IBU. It's a pain. It's a mess. Just don't do it. Just let it go. Just say it is what it is and rock on. Maybe a little lower ABV will be a good thing. Again, like I said, and if you've gone this far towards the end, I wish I could just give you something, but we'll do another video for the giveaways. But yeah, anytime someone says, hey, how do I get my efficiencies? How do I do that in a form? Just put this link to this video. It'd be awesome. Make sure you hit like, make sure you hit subscribe. Um, actually picked up a Sam Adams. It's their winter ale. It's like a citrusy winter beer, but really good. Um, uh, Sam Adams has been kind of hit or miss and lately they've been really good, but that's really good. <laughs> So cheers. Hey, have a great holiday season and see you next year too.